just east of Niagara Falls in northwest New York State, an area with the deceptively serene name of Love Canal turned out to be one of America's most notorious toxic waste horror stories. An inadequate cover on a chemical company's dump site allowed a deadly brew of toxins to leak into a suburban neighborhood. A public health scare erupted. Over 900 families left their homes. Several years and hundreds of millions of dollars had to be spent to try to stop the further spread of the contaminants. The Love Canal originally got its name from entrepreneur William T. Love. In 1894, he began construction on a man-made canal that he envisioned would link the Niagara River to Lake Ontario. His plan was to use the power of the river as it rushes towards the falls, diverting it before it goes over the falls and carrying it north through a canal which would wind up at this escarpment or cliff and pour down and provide the power that's necessary to generate electricity. The canal was essentially a trench dug in the clay soil of the area. After only 3,000 feet were excavated, a pair of unforeseen events brought construction to a halt. One was the depression of the 1890s, severe depression. Secondly was uh, somebody named Tesla uh, devised a way to have uh, alternating current instead of direct current so you didn't have to be right on top of the source of power. Alternating current made it unnecessary to develop industry and Love's planned city adjacent to his canal. For the next several years, Love's unfinished canal served as a summer swimming hole for nearby residents. Then in 1942, Hooker Chemical Company acquired the canal. They uh, ended up using the property. It was a, uh, pretty much a 16-acre hole in the ground at that point, uh, 3,000 feet long by 80 feet wide to 100 feet wide, um, probably anywhere from 8 to 15 or 20 feet in depth. And they used it for uh, disposal of industrial waste from a period of time from about 1942 to 1952 or 53. By 1953, the canal was filled with over 20,000 tons of chemical wastes, including caustic solvents and pesticides. Hooker had no further use for the canal, and with no regulations in place to stop them at the time, they simply covered the dump site with a layer of clay and soil from the area. Soon grass grew and helped hide what festered just a few feet below. Of course, everybody played on, on that area because it's not a canal, it's covered over. And sometimes kids would get, their feet would get irritated from running around in the canal. As Niagara Falls' growing population spread, the New York Board of Education was looking for inexpensive land and expressed interest in the property Hooker owned. The chemical company offered to sell the no longer useful land for one dollar. The deed did contain a warning about the contents of the canal, but that did not stop the sale. Well, they didn't build the school directly on top of the canal. They built a playground there. And on the black top of the playground, there was like a percolation of a taffy-like watery substance coming out of uh, the ground into this playground. At around the same time, there continued to be increased development in the area. A series of homes went up around the canal. None of the homes were built right on the canal. They were adjacent to it. And then a lot of residents complained of um, not only smells in their basement, but of oozing of the similar types of chemicals into those sub pumps, into the drainage ditches around their basements. The leachate that, um, that was found throughout the, the Love Canal community was generally a black goop, to use a, a technical, non-technical term. Um, it was a very thick black material. It was very oily based. It almost looked like a tar-like material. Um, it was wat more watery in some instances than in others. Those who had bought homes in the area hadn't been warned in their deeds of what was beneath the grassy field. For new residents like Lois Gibbs, something was clearly wrong. In 1977, her son began attending the 99th Street School. I just remember after living at Love Canal for a while, Michael got sick and he kept getting new diseases. He had asthma, liver problems, immune system problem, urinary tract disorder, which required two operations to correct. I mean, it was just like one thing after the other. And I could not figure out what was wrong with him. 
Around this time, a newspaper reporter wrote a story about the canal and what was buried in it. Now the residents had an explanation for the mysterious substances and illnesses. And Lois Gibbs decided something had to be done. First, she tried to have her child transferred out of the school. And they told her that uh, they wouldn't do it because there was no problem. There was no chemical problem there. And so she started uh, going up and down the street, talking to people, talking to neighbors, asking if they were interested in joining a little group that would try to get the school cleaned up. Awareness of the problem and complaints from the residents became much more widespread after the winter of 1977.